Welcome back to Echo Ridge, where we're trying to clean up some mess caused by three hydrogen rockets going off at the same time. Allow me to introduce you to Exhibit A. We knew the rockets were going to cause some issues, but now that we can specifically see what issues they've caused, we can do some things to prevent it in the future. First, it superheated this entire area to include the fact that it melted whatever type of gas pipe was in here that was pumping fresh oxygen in. Not that that auction would make the situation any better, because the auction is 262 degrees over here, and as high as 502 degrees over here. A long time ago, we thought it would be a good idea to take all this nice oxygen and keep cooling off the bunker tiles. Well, that was using radiation rockets. Hydrogen rockets don't care about your silly solutions. They just melt everything. So I think step one is going to be a put some insulated tiles down here at the bottom instead of the bunker tiles. That will help keep all these bunker tiles from superheating. And as you can see, the heat has managed to spread all the way down to about this point here. And additionally, I should have remembered that there was radiant gas pipes there that were about to take in a whole bunch of hydrogen rocket exhaust, and we could have prevented that to begin with. We also melted a gas vent here and here, and I need to put those back relatively quickly. I think this time, will you steal? But then that also begs the question, wouldn't it be time to upgrade this system here? Remember, this was a thermal aqua tuner cooling solution for the sleet wheat back before we had access to plastic and steam turbines. But now that we do, why not just replace this with a proper system? Just to jog everybody's memory, what happens in this system is whenever the thermal aqua tuner gets too warm, more fresh water comes and gets dropped off into this room, which cools the thermo aqua tuner back down, which then enables it to keep cooling down all this sleet wheat. And it works great. The thermo aqua tuner never really gets above 185 degrees. So why not upgrade it? Well, because we have so many other interconnecting systems that I'm a little worried that as soon as we do, bad things are going to happen. Not to mention the fact that at this point, I'd have to do some major rerouting of the coolant of course, it would be great to get some super coolant in here instead of brine, because there's no room up here to put a steam turbine. Because remember, all of this area gets superheated. I might be able to put a system over here and just run the coolant lines all the way over, and that way I can completely get rid of this. Maybe I'll work on that a little bit in the background. Another issue caused by the rockets was the superheating of the mechanized airlock. Well, I know it's not a lot of heat, Considering the airlock is still sitting at minus 209, I think it got down to about minus 170. But now the inside of this room is sitting at, I don't know, minus 238? It gets a little bit colder the further down we go, and eventually this coolant loop would be able to freeze it back down. But in any case, I think it would be wise to replace this mechanized airlock with a couple of insulated tiles and just deconstruct them anytime we had to get in. I say all that, but we shouldn't actually have to get in here anymore. Quote, this should be it, end quote. And once we get these insulated tiles in, I think we will have prevented all of the issues for the next launch. Although this room here has really taken a beating. It will eventually cool down once we get more, I don't know, colder oxygen in here. And the fact that I made all these transformers out of gold did not help. So I think first things first is we're going to upgrade them all to steel. But as for the primary objective for this episode, the ESS Mo is almost at the space cow planet. The crew is doing hunky-dory. There's a little bit of stress, about 9%, probably because despite our best efforts, there's eight kilos worth of oxygen in this room, which means all of their eardrums have been popped. My guess is the reason why it's happening is because the duplicate is actually sitting in this tile right here. And so when they exhale their carbon dioxide, the oxalite overwrites it. So just like the problem with having the storage bin filled with oxalite down the bottom, the same thing's happening here just at a lesser effect due to the fact that there are four dupes in here, so the chances of a piece of carbon dioxide landing in this tile are pretty high. It's not too big of a deal because we do have the duplicates getting the tickled tootsies, which helps reduce their stress. They also have the high morale and they have their friends who appreciate them and give them pleasant chit chat. Yay for friends. The ESS Curly and the ESS Larry have no such issues because I'm assuming there's just not enough carbon dioxide floating around for it to land right here at the storage bin holding all the oxalite. 
Now the oxygen pressure in here is still sitting at a wonderful 1800 grams. So I was still looking at a new system to be able to cool the sleet wheat when I remembered I had the two thermo aqua tuners in here. Now this thermo aqua tuner does run 8% of the time. The rest of the weight is being carried by this thermo aqua tuner that's running 96% of the time. Which kind of makes me think I should be able to use this thermo aqua tuner to keep all the sleet wheat cold. Yeah, it'd be somewhat of a nuisance to be able to get this thermo aqua tuner's coolant pipes over here, but I think it could happen. Not to mention the fact it would end up saving us power because instead of running two thermo aqua tuners, we'd only be running one. Plus, we wouldn't be ejecting steam into the vacuum of space anymore and spending more power on this gas pump. So I think I'm going to try it. And it's actually going to be easier to connect than you'd think. I'm just going to come straight out of this thermo aqua tuner and go directly up. And by severing the connection right here and removing this liquid bridge, we've now separated both lines without having to even get in here. But boy, is this going to be a nuisance getting everything over there. I suppose the first step should be disconnecting this system from any interconnected system that it belongs to, namely our reactor coolant coming out, which this isn't going to be too bad. All we have to do is disconnect from here and then start removing these pipes. We're also going to throw caution to the wind and just start deconstructing stuff. Yeah, that looks good. Meanwhile, at the gassy moo planet, we are in orbit, which means we can get our first look at overseeing the planetoid. Where are my gassy moos? Hello, moo cows. I see we have some gas grass here, which this is always great to see. For those of you wondering, gas grass is a pain because it requires not only dirt, but also chlorine in order to grow. Now the planetoid itself is pretty small. Maybe the gassy moos are inside. This planetoid will start getting gassy moodier showers though too. So maybe they get delivered by those moodiers here soon. No matter, we're gonna be able to find out. First thing we're gonna do is take Rover's module and land Rover probably somewhere over here. And the reason why we're putting Rover here is because we're gonna end up putting the rocket platform here for the simple reason that that hydrogen rocket is not gonna play around. I see you little moo cows. Don't worry, daddy's coming. Now, because we have both a trailblazer module and a Rover's lander on that rocket, we don't even need Rover to be doing any digging around. But I figured it'd be a little convenient just to get all the work started. We're also going to need to deconstruct the lander, go inside the ESS Mo, and undock a suit, and put Carol in it. And then as soon as Carol puts it on, we have to pause. Because otherwise, Carol's going to try to hang the suit back up. Just to give you the example, there they go. I don't know why they choose to do that, because they haven't gone through an atmosuit checkpoint that tells them to take the suit off, but they do it. So what you have to do is make sure they have the suit on, and then pause it. Oh, you're too quick for me, Carol. You're too quick. All right, at this animation, I'm going to assume that the suit is on because they're all sorts of happy. Well, it still says equipping Atmos suit, so I better be careful. Quick pause and unpause. All right, now they're 100% inside the suit. So in the Trailblazer module, we can select Carol and click deploy. And here comes Carol now. First thing we do is deconstruct the Trailblazer lander. That way we have enough steel to put down a rocket platform. I suppose while Rover's just standing there, they can also start building some ladders. Although some of these might end up melting because Igneous Rock has a melting point of 1,409 degrees. But without further ado, we can now... Oh no! I was going to say we can now land the rocket here. Unfortunately, it does not have enough height. It's only 32 tiles. Oh, Carol, we better hurry. So what we have to do now is actually dig down. So we will stop them from doing that nonsense. Carol, you're amazing, but you really might want to hurry. That suit's oxygen is not going to last forever, and the only thing on this planetoid is natural gas. With the rocket platform being constructed, we have a couple more tiles up here that'll probably need to be dug out. But this gives us 35 tiles worth of height, and that is just the amount that we need, and Carol, you might want to move. Way to go, Carol. Uh, Rover? Uh, maybe you too, buddy? And here comes the ESS Mo. Now we can keep building these ladders, and hopefully get Carol inside the rocket before it's too late. They already have major radiation sickness and they're a bit hungry. Fancy a snack, Carol. There's some gas grass here. By the way, this is all chlorine because all this liquid chlorine here got superheated. All right, well, Carol's home safe and sound. 
not too big of a deal. Now, because this is max difficulty, we're going to do a couple of contingencies, starting with putting a couple of tiles here. That way, the radiation, which is pretty severe at 312 rods per cycle, is somewhat blocked as they're running down this ladder. We also need to make sure there's a gas vent over here, so in the case that we are ever not overpressured, that we can get rid of some of this carbon dioxide that is starting to build up. I mean, there's 18 kilos worth of oxygen in here. Not great, guys. Not great. The issue is there's not a lot of metals on this planetoid. Save this one security door that I think we're going to go ahead and deconstruct for the good of our friends. We're also going to need to start building some ladders down here so that we can make our way over. Which is good because it means the suits will be using some of that oxygen so we'll be able to get rid of some of the gas pressure in here. And I think for right now, I'm going to move all the oxalite even higher. That way there's even less of a chance that the oxalite will overwrite the carbon dioxide. Should have thought of that one a little earlier. Another disadvantage of the fact that there's no metal here is I can't build an airborne critter trap that requires 50 kilos of a metal ore. I'm going to do a little bit more exploring because there may be some down here at the bottom. And I also remember that I can probably just move the artifacts without having to put them on a pedestal using the new move to command. I'm going to click move to go inside the ESS Mo and drop it off right there. I'm going to do the same to this useless machine, clicking move to click inside the rocket and have it dropped off right next to it. We're also going to put down a wonderful little mini pod because that's a requirement for an achievement. Specifically, the Great Escape requires that you have five colonies established using a mini pod. So far, we have came all the way down to this side, and unfortunately, there is no metal. Checking the star map, you can see there's only one chlorine gas vent here and a moo biome. Well, when you click on the moo biome, it brings up its database entry. And here we can see all the elements that are included in that biome, and none of them are metal. I was also thinking about just putting a targeting beacon down and sending whatever we need. But because Carol's already sitting at 66% stress, I don't want to push it as far as how long we're here on this planetoid. So now I just need to figure out where to put this critter drop off. And I guess it's going to have to be right here where the duplicants will no longer have one mess table to share. We're also going to deconstruct this arrow pot, but we'll rebuild it and put it right here. Now, unfortunately, that only makes this a recreation room, which isn't doing anything for our morale, save what they get from the party line phone. But we're not going to have the critter drop off here for very long. No, no, little buddy, don't fly all the way up there. And since we have enough copper ore, we're going to try to put down a few of these traps to get a few gassy moves. Now, the gassy moves, they eat gas grass. In fact, they eat 50% of growth per cycle. Well, when you click on a gas grass, you can see that if you're domestically growing them, it takes them four cycles, or in other words, 25% growth per cycle. Which means if you're domestically growing the gas grass, using the chlorine in the dirt, you'd be able to feed a gassy moo off of two gas grasses. But because we don't have a source of chlorine to be able to feed those gassy moos over on a home planetoid, we're probably going to end up wild planting them, which means they're going to take 16 cycles to grow, which means they only grow six and a quarter percent per cycle. Well, with a gassy moo requiring 50% growth to eat per cycle, that means we need eight gas grasses per gassy moo. That's going to be a lot, especially considering when you wild plant them, at the minimum, it's going to take a ton of space. And it looks like in order to arm these traps, we're going to need somebody with critter ranching one. That's not a big deal. We'll just take one of these duplicates that doesn't have a big morale requirement, such as a Lady Ruff. And congratulations, Lady Ruff. You now have Critter Ranching 1. It'd be really good if I can grab all this liquid chlorine. Then we would be able to actually irrigate the gas grass as long as we kept it in its liquid form, which requires you keeping it at below minus 35. Oh, well, that just doesn't look pleasant, does it? The poor gassy moo doesn't have any room at all inside that trap. Welcome, little buddies. If you don't mind not expelling any natural gas for the time being, everyone would appreciate it. Based on the amount of wild planted gas grass it's going to take to feed the gassy moos, I think three is going to be plenty. I'm still not even sure how we're going to be able to make that happen. The last step is going to be building a storage bin so we can collect all the gas grass seeds. And with enough seeds loaded, I think we're done here on this planetoid of Methaniel. Everybody all loaded up? Good stuff. Now, we still have a range of 25 tiles, so I think we're going to spin by here and see if we can grab another artifact that'll actually load onto the rocket itself. And that's it. Our launch is underway. 
Goodbye, wonderful space cows. We'll take good care of your friends. I hope. Now, there's probably some of you wondering why I went through the process of grabbing these gassy moos and not just raising them where there was plenty of chlorine over on Methaniel. Well, it's because up until recently, you never really had a reason to have gassy moos. Well, now we can create brackeen by milking the space cow. So I'm looking forward to sort of discovering what kind of systems we're going to have to build with it. Speaking of which, I have some ideas on how to keep these gassy moos fed. And it starts with the new bleach stone hopper. By using gold and salt, which we have plenty of both, we can produce bleach stone. Well, if we let that bleach stone off gas into chlorine and then cool it to minus 35, it'll turn into the liquid chlorine that we need to feed the gas grass, which then we could feed to the gassy moose. And I may have forgotten that I was working on this system here. We've completely bulldozed it and now all of our sleet weed is getting too warm and oh my goodness, I'm going to kill all the bees again. Unfortunately, I have to report that apparently the hydrogen rocket no longer stores an artifact by default and spaced out. As you can see, this radioactive asteroid field we've been mining from still says there's an available artifact. Well, that stinks. We'll have to put some artifact modules on them when they get back. Notice too that while the ESS Curly is sitting here mining, that NAS is doing some telescope work. Really convenient. Two birds, one stone again. With that knowledge, though, there's no reason for us to stop by this obsolete space station, so we will change its course and head right back to Tuxedo. So I've managed to move the loop mostly. With some creative plumbing, the loop now comes out this way, crosses this bridge, and then heads over into the sleet wheat farm, where thankfully the bees are still alive, three of them. And then it comes all the way back through here and then heads down. The difficult part now is getting it tied back in here. I'm wondering if I can build a bridge across this gap without actually being able to see that middle tile. I'm not 100% sure. And it looks like we were. So we were able to bring the loop all the way back. Anybody hungry for a little bit of spaghetti today? It may not look pretty, but it works and it's filling. Now, right now, this loop is a mix of super coolant and brine because the super coolant was less in the existing loop. But as soon as I get this cooled back down to where I know we're not going to make the bees go extinct again, I'll upgrade it to super coolant. Now we have to figure out where we're going to raise some gassy moos. I've never made a gassy moo ranch, so this is going to take a little bit of work, but we need to start, I guess, with the bleach stone hopper. Now the bleach stone hopper is yet another building that produces a lot of heat, 3000 DTUs. So of course, I'm going to want to put it in here. And it looks like we might be able to build it right here in this perfect little spot. There's not much to the bleach stone hopper. It requires 480 watts, that's not too bad. And there are no other inputs to speak of. So all you really have to do is load it up manually with salt and with gold, and voila, you'll start getting bleach stone. Well, we want to do something with that bleach stone. So I think to start with, we're going to put an auto sweeper here and a wonderful conveyor loader, not made out of copper, that would be a mistake. And a wonderful conveyor loader made out of steel. The wonderful ESS Mo has returned home and so far our fixes seem to have worked. There's no sort of damage that the rocket caused. Uh, never mind. Apparently we were able to melt obsidian bridges. Stupid hydrogen rockets. All right, the obsidian bridge has a melting point of 2,726 degrees. There is literally nothing else that I can think of. I was thinking maybe ceramic, but the ceramic has a melting point of 1,849. My only guess is I may have messed it up. I mean, that doesn't sound like me, but hey, anything's possible, right? With the rock at home, we're also gonna undock all of these suits, and that way they should come pick them up. We also got rid of the Atmosuit checkpoint because we don't want duplicates taking their suits on and off every time they come in here. And of course, we will ground it so people stop using this potty. Now, the Bleachstone Hopper doesn't give you a lot of Bleachstone. For 500 grams of gold and 30 kilos worth of salt, you're given 20 kilos worth of sand and 10 kilos worth of bleachstone. But luckily, we don't need a lot of bleachstone. But what bleachstone we do create is going to end up in this little room here. Now, I've never made a bleachstone to liquid chlorine sort of system, so your mileage may vary with this particular design. But I'm thinking through it. It's small, it's compact, and I think it might be exactly what we need. Step one is vacuuming this whole room out. Now we've put a petroleum liquid lock in here because this room is eventually going to get very cold. I don't think we're going to need to come in and out of it, but just in case, I figured I'd put a liquid lock so if we did need to repair something, we could jump in there. 
With this room completely vacuumed out, now all I have to do is drop off Bleachstone and we'll have a wonderful room filled with chlorine. Before I turn on this auto sweeper, I wanted to show you how adorable the animation of the Bleachstone hopper is. Notice that there's Bleachstone all around here and it's because it comes shooting out of this, well, hopper. And there it goes. Isn't that amazing? But then we'll just grab consumable ore, bleach stone, and our conveyor loader will quickly get loaded up. And the bleach stone's being dropped off, turning all of this room into a chlorine bath. Now, in order to make sure it keeps off gassing, we need to make sure that there's available pressure. Well, we also happen to need liquid chlorine. So all we really have to do is drive down the temperature in here, which will turn this gas chlorine into a liquid, which will also vacuum the place out. So I'm going to build a thermo aqua tuner up here, but because of the positioning, it's going to be a little awkward getting the piping around. Because on this side, we have a pump that's doing something else, and on this side, we have neutronium that we can't build through. So we're going to use a configuration that probably not a lot of people have seen, and that's by putting the bridge vertically. The connections are still the same, it's just we're putting the bridge in a different spot because we just don't have the room to do it the way we usually do. While we're working on that cooling loop, I wanted to give you another issue that comes with planting gas grass, and that's the fact that it requires 10,000 lux. I wanted to put as many ceiling lights as I could in one little area, and while it looks pretty bright, the lux is only 5,700, so we're gonna have to make some changes. We have a decent amount of chlorine in here, so I think it's about time that I start turning it all into a liquid, and I realize I'm not gonna be able to drop the bleach stone here, I'm going to have to drop it right here so it stays on this tile. Otherwise, it's going to be sitting in a bath of chlorine and not be able to off gas. We'll get that fixed up immediately. We also need to drop off some super coolant in here and I'm going to use the pump that we already have. And instead of sending it off to feed the gas grass, I'm just going to have it bridge right onto the coolant loop, disconnecting it from here. And we'll get this coolant loop going and start to drive down the temperature of this chlorine so we have some liquid. And once again, we put a liquid pipe element sensor because I am a proficient gamer and not a professional gamer. And just like that, we have some liquid chlorine. Right now, I have the thermo sensor set on minus 40, which is enough to turn that gas into a nice chlorine bath. But there's some precautions that we need to make. For instance, we don't want the chlorine to come up all the way up this level. Otherwise, it'll start mixing with the petroleum. So what I could do is just put another tile, say, right here. And that way it does not matter how high the chlorine gets. If the bleach stone gets covered up by chlorine at that point, it's fine. Because we'll have enough liquid chlorine to where we don't need the bleach stone to keep going off. But I think there's a better way to do it, and that's using some automation. Yeah, we'll probably still put the tile there, but we're not going to want any more than, say, this amount of chlorine. So when we get that amount of chlorine, we'll be able to shut this vent and that way no more bleach stone will be dropped off. The last thing I want to do in this area is put a couple of shift plates down. I ended up using all my diamond, and for some goofy reason I had not been making any more. So we're not going to be able to use diamond temperature shift plates, so we're just going to use some regular old granite. Not a big deal, just enough in the middle to where the liquids and the gases above it will be able to share those thermals. The idea being that as soon as the bleach stone off gases, it liquefies thus creating a vacuum and leaving enough space for more bleach stone to off gas. So here's our, I don't know, temporary gassy move stable. It's got some problems. First of all, it's too big. It's at 108 tiles. And as you may remember, a stable can only be 96 tiles. So I'm trying to figure out which tiles I'm gonna fill in to make this thing still work. But I know I'm gonna have to put down a critter drop off and a grooming station and all of that. But then the problem came up I couldn't find the thing where you milk the gassy moves to get that glorious brackeen. Well, you remember when I said you don't want to get rid of all your research stations? Well, here you go. Brackeen flow is actually not researched in this colony. We haven't done research in so long, I don't even know if we have all the buildings to do it. But we're going to find out because we want that milking station. I just realized that our material study terminal was sitting in here a long time ago. Well, let me see what I can work out temporarily in here. The dupe will be fine standing there just for a few minutes, right? All we're going to do is wait for the material study terminal. Ooh, watch out, John. So all we're going to do is fill up the material study terminal with its 100 rad bolts, and then we'll redirect the rad bolts 
to bounce back and forth in between these rad bolt reflectors until we need more rad bolts. This one might get the trophy for the most duct tape solution I've ever done. And that says something here at Echo Ridge Gaming. I think our stable is about ready for some wonderful gassy moves. Unfortunately, one gassy moo expired before I could get the stable built, but that's okay. We'll put a wonderful trap right here. Ooh, I may have forgotten to redirect the rad bolts. In order to protect our dupes because safety is number one, we've gone ahead and redirected it so the rad bolts will just stay in there. So whenever we do need to refill, all we have to do is point to the left and we're refilled. One contingency you're going to have to make with the gassy moves is they take up literally four tiles. So when we drop the gassy moo off right here, it's now kind of stuck inside this pneumatic door. So I'm going to open this pneumatic door and leave it open so that way the gassy moo can move freely. And they were some hungry boys because they ate up all that gas grass pretty quickly. Now the gassy moos have a couple of new traits since the update, and that is the welcoming mood attribute, which is increasing their acumen, which is increasing their accumulation, accumulation, and their brackeen supply. The accumulation is how they're going to be able to call additional gassy moves because they don't themselves reproduce. Now, I don't know exactly how this works. I'm guessing some gassy moves is going to wander in and then I'm going to have to put down a critter trap or something. I don't know, but tell me that isn't adorable. I know everybody calls them space cows, but truly they're actually based off of the manatee. And for those of you who are not from the state of Florida or don't have a background in marine life research, go ahead and Google manatee because that's exactly what these little fellows look like. And you might be asking yourself, what's with all the mooing and the cow references? Well, that's because manatees are affectionately referred to as sea cows. In other updates, I had forgotten about the Larry and the Curly out in space, and poor Naz is at 76% stress, because once again, we have popped eardrums. The oxalite has kept going off, and I'm assuming it's because, well, the carbon dioxide from the dupe sleeping passes right by this storage bin and then gets overwritten. So I'm gonna have to think of a little bit of a different setup to make sure that the oxalite doesn't do this in the future. For now though, we're sending both rockets home. We wanna outfit them with the artifact modules as well, and make some of those brief changes. And we just received another colony achievement, which you can probably guess what this one's going to be, because our wonderful sea cows are now tame. So we've achieved moving on up. That only leaves the shine bug for us to tame, and then we'll also have Critter Whisperer. And now that they are tame, you can see that we have the accumulation with an adorable little graphic here. And you can see that it says at 100%, a gassy moo will call a friend to join them on this asteroid. We can also see their brackeen supply, and they're getting 25% supply per cycle. And we have finally finished the research, which is good because Eilart was not having a good time at all. So we'll get rid of all this, and then be able to put our interplanetary launcher back as well. Now we've been given access to the Brax Wax Cleaner, which is going to be able to take brackeen and turn it into brine and brack wax, and also the critter fountain. Now the critter fountain's an interesting little device that increases the critter's mood. It gives them a bonus to happiness to where you could fit double the amount of critters in a stable. And that has to do with the changes to overcrowded. We'll take a look at that in a future episode. But finally, and most importantly for us in this episode is the milking station. Luckily, we have a nice little spot right here. It requires a refined metal and some plastic. And because we don't really have anything else better to do with it, we're just going to throw it in a couple of buffer tanks. Absolutely wonderful. Now, for those of you unindoctrinated in the gassy moves, whenever they eat the gas grass, they excrete natural gas. In fact, 10 kilos per cycle of natural gas. That's the reason why I built all of this sort of down here in this pit and that way the natural gas would end up floating down and not escaping to our base. But as you can see, it's starting to build up a little bit. So I'm gonna put a gas element sensor right about here. I'm also gonna tie it in with a filter gate, throwing it right next to it, and then connecting the whole thing up to this gas pump. Now again, this is gonna take a little bit of give and take, but the idea is gonna be if this gas element sensor detects natural gas for longer than 30 seconds, send the gas pump a green signal. 
and that way it'll start pumping that natural gas out. Now, for now, I just have everything going out into the vacuum of space. And that's because we have a lot of other junk gases in it, too. Because all manner of things are going to come into this room, whether it be oxygen, carbon dioxide, and that sort of thing. The next step is putting a gas filter on it, though. Because I don't want to lose all that precious natural gas. So I think we're going to put it right here. And then if it is natural gas, it's going to come out this way. If it's not, it's going to go to the vacuum of space. So we'll disconnect it from there. And then we'll make the long run all the way down and across and finally end up into our wonderful natural gas generator. Now remember, it's only 10 kilos per cycle, so I don't think this natural gas generator will have any problem eating all of that natural gas. But once again, we'll have to see. The only thing I care about is getting the natural gas lower than this point here, and that way the rancher who comes in to both milk the gassy moose and grooming them and won't have to deal with the eye irritation that comes with standing inside of natural gas. And it didn't take too long for the system to work just as intended. Now the ranchers will not be standing in natural gas. This whole area becomes one giant natural gas buffer tank, and we have a nice backstock of natural gas. So at some point, I may even add another natural gas generator. Now for the bad news. This poor gassy moo is 75 cycles old. And unfortunately, their accumulation is only at 45%. So we're not going to be able to keep two gassy moos in this ranch, which makes me kind of sad. But it's not going to be a problem for very long. This other gassy moo is only 34 cycles old and gaining an accumulation of 6% per cycle, which means after a little over 16 cycles, they'll call in another gassy moo. And eventually, we're going to have too many gassy moves. Because during a gassy moose lifetime, they will call in, the math comes out to be 4.5 other gassy moves, but you can't have a 0.5 of a gassy moo, so we're actually only going to get four gassy moves per gassy moo. One will replace it, which will leave us an excess of three gassy moves. But not a big deal because it's just going to give us another source of barbecue. Each gassy moo is worth 16,000 calories worth of meat. That's the same as a Solvol. One minor change that I'm making is I'm taking out the manual airlock and just gonna put a standard pneumatic door in. The reason why I'm doing that is because there's 1,300 grams worth of oxygen on the other side of the door, but only 300 on this side, which would eventually impact our natural gas because I want there to be enough pressure up top that it keeps pushing the natural gas down towards its gas pump. And because natural gas is heavier, none of it should escape through this pneumatic door, so it shouldn't be a big deal anyways. In other news, the ESS Larry has made it back. And as promised, we're going to outfit this rocket with an artifact transport module. In fact, we're going to outfit it with a couple. We're going to do the same with our colonization rocket. And whenever the ESS Curly finally decides to get back home, we'll do the same with it. The last thing I wanted to show you when it comes to the new buildings that came with this update has to do with the plant pulverizer. The plant pulverizer is the other method in order to get brackeen. We're already up to 400 kilos worth because of the milking of our gassy moose. But the other way to get brackeen is to smash up nosh beans, sleet wheat grains, or pinch of pepper nuts. Unfortunately, these tend to be pretty expensive for considering you're only going to get 20 kilos worth of brackeen for two nosh beans and 18 kilos of water, or 10 sleet wheat grains and 15 kilos of water, or 3 kilos worth of pinch of pepper nut and 17 kilos worth of water. I was really hoping all this extra gas grass that I have laying around would be able to be pulverized into bracking. That would sort of make sense, but unfortunately you can't. So I don't know what else to do with all this gas grass. And now you're going to get to witness one of the most adorable animations in the game. The gassy moo is, I can't believe I'm going to say this, utterly full. Their bracking supply is at 100%. The gassy moo was on the way over to get milked. Unfortunately, they somehow got themselves entombed. So I'm going to try deconstructing this hydroponic farm, and hopefully that frees the gassy moo. Miss Pandamanda calls... Oh, no, move out of the way, Sulphur! There we go. Miss Pandamanda then starts milking the gassy moo. The gassy moo's very appreciative of it. I mean, look at that smile, huh? I really want to know why the critter got stuck on that tile. And after all said and done, we got another 200 kilos worth of bracking. Well, I hope you thought this episode was amusing. Okay, I'll stop. But I still want to hear all of your wonderful cow puns in the comments below. Don't forget to hit the like button if you're still enjoying this series. 
So until next time, much love, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.